I didn't think, oh, should I pick left foot or right foot? While M Matt Dawson was passing the ball, I wasn't thinking, it's up to me now. I just wasn't thinking. Mm. The ball hits you and it's just an out-of-body experience. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me at the back? Brilliant. Mm -hmm. So today we are here to welcome yeah. Johnny Wilkinson. Yeah. Johnny Wilkinson, CBE, is widely regarded as one of the best rugby union players of all time. As a player, he won 91 caps for England and was inducted into the World Rugby Hall of Fame in 2016. He infamously scored the winning drop kick in the 2003 Rugby World Cup final. And since he stopped playing, Johnny has started his own drinks company as well as working as a pundit for ITV Sport. So please join me in welcoming Johnny Wilkinson tonight. <laughs> Well, that was a bit louder than when Dominic Cummings came in. <laughs> um, thanks so much for coming, Johnny. How are you doing today? I'm great, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks for everyone that's coming, and, and yeah, thanks for the invite. Um, no I'm looking forward to a good chat. Yeah, I'm so glad you could make it. So we thought we'd start right at the beginning and talk about how you were very young when you first, obviously, your career kicked off, but also when you won the World Cup. And I wondered how you found that kind of being projected into the spotlight at such a young age. I think um, everything probably where I'm going to answer from on these things comes down to understanding a bit more about myself at the time. Mm. <clears throat> and I grew up with a, a, really, a really deep sense of kind of fear about everything. Mm -hmm. But I also had a real passion and purpose for any sports, but especially those that involve the ball. So I had that going on and then I had this real sense of fear about everything. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, if something didn't go quite right, there was this darkness about it. And it's funny to mention that now talking about this, but there was such a driving force because as a young kid, what I did was trying to find anything I could from what I was hearing, from what I was seeing in order to construct myself against that mm. and also construct myself for my passion. And those two things came together in a recipe that in many ways worked and in many ways didn't. Um, and what I found I had because of that was just a desire to be perfect, a desire to try and save everyone and everything, a desire to try and um, fight to the last second and, and this whole kind of understanding of what my version of bravery was, all from this young idea. And it meant that I could go out in the field and just, and just go to levels that people couldn't go to because I had no choice. It was deeper than just, oh, we lost. It was like, I, this cannot happen. And from a young kid, when things wouldn't go right and I couldn't change it, I was a disaster. And I, yeah, that, that got into a, a, a sort of an interesting space for my parents trying to deal with that. But things like fame and things like their success, it kind of unfortunately just added to the mix. Mm -hmm. So when more and more people know about you, recognize you, and you're still trying to be perfect and get everything right and you still need everyone to feel a certain way and think a certain way about you. And now more people know about you. It just becomes suffocating. Mm. So I withdrew further and further to the little spaces I could control. So I spent more time at home. I spent more time on the pitch with the ball where I felt safe. I spent less time going out, trying anything, doing anything new. I got more and more reclusive. And, and unfortunately what happened when we won the World Cup was the within two weeks of winning the World Cup, I played my first game. And in that first game, I, I just, my neck gave in. And from that moment on, um, I had 14 injuries on the trot because of this fear and this constant stress of trying to, trying to stay ready and alert to it and, and fight against it. So not only was I at the peak of my career and at the point where I felt like I probably was getting to where I needed to be, you know, like, okay, I've achieved what, everything I need to achieve. And then it was all taken away. Mm. And then you had the fame. So now I'm, I'm doing nothing. I'm achieving nothing. I couldn't be less perfect. I couldn't be more or less of a fighter or a warrior or a, a savior to anyone. And now everyone's looking at you. So in that period, it all kind of came deeply crashing down. And 
and it was in a way a, a kind of very necessary thing. But my England career was was kind of six years at the beginning, four years in the middle where nothing happened, and then two or three at the end. So I didn't have a long career really. Um, and the fame kicked in at, at a time when, for my life, I, I was supposed to go through that. I was supposed to kind of <clears throat> experience that as part of my evolution. Rugby was a big part of it, and that fame and everything just put it in a melting pot and just sort of said, right, you've got to find your way out of this. And every way I tried to get out of it just hurt even more because I refused to let go of what it was asking me to let go of. Mm. We'll talk more about mental health and, and what you went through in, in a little bit, but I just wondered, where do you think that fear kind of came from? Was it just something that was always with you as a child? Or? Yeah, no, no idea. Mm. Um, I'm very interested in trying to find out these things. Mm. Not the same as every part of my game I would work on and explore to every angle. And, and I've explored a lot, but what I never got to the basis of, of what that is, and I never will, but what I'm getting to the basis of understanding is how it's been a huge driving force in my life and how it's been guiding my life in a beautiful way, even though it's hurt. Yeah, it's strange because in a way then, would you have done as well without it? You don't, I suppose it's hard to know. There, there's no such thing as doing well or not doing well with mm. or without it. It's literally guiding me to everything I need to become mm. everything that I'm supposed to in this lifetime. All I need to do is listen to it yeah. rather than fight it. And this is the fighting it, which has caused all the problems. So yeah, it, it's, it's been part of my makeup and it's been brilliant because I've been able to, <clears throat> you give me a session to do in the gym and it's just like, you tell me to run up and down a beach as fast as you can mm -hmm. four times, which this is what something we used to do at Newcastle, right? Your pre-season training, run up the beach as fast as you can, run back as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. And everyone's kind of thinking, well, how do we pace ourselves? And I'm just saying, did you not hear what he said? As fast as you can. Yeah. just go and then when you get there and everyone's lying on the ground and the coach says well done guys and he's literally teeing you up to say go and, go and get in the cars and see you tomorrow and he goes do it again <laughs> and everyone goes oh and it's like i'm already halfway there mm -hmm. because i don't it doesn't matter yeah. and and if he's, someone runs at me as 148 kilograms it doesn't matter i don't have that understanding of what about me because i have this fear that's saying behind me saying you have to go to places where other people don't. Mm. You cannot afford to. And now, obviously, as you get older, it becomes a bit stranger because you've got no idea what it is. And it's yeah. clear you, can, you can't see it. You know it's not really there, but it's in you deep down. Mm. Um, and so it's been you know, magical for me to be able to take a ball and, and lock me in a room with a ball, and I'll come out being able to do anything you want with it. Mm. There's no boredom. And that's been a real power. The other power, unfortunate part of it, is that some people would be able to walk down the street and handle something, which would just knock me mm. for six. People are going, what are you doing? It's just life, deal with it. Yeah. And there's me shaking in the corner, trying to like, I can't work it out. So I've understood that I, I use that as far as it would go. And when it stopped going, I kept trying to use it. Mm. And it just hurt and hurt and hurt. And then I started to try and evolve with it. And that's been my journey ever since. Yeah. And you touched on being a perfectionist, and that's something we hear quite a lot about you. But when I was hearing that, I was thinking, well, rugby's very imperfect, or any sport is quite an imperfect thing, right? Like you can have a weird call, or you can have weather blowing the ball around, or yeah. you know, something. How did, how did you kind of deal with being such a perfectionist and yet playing something I think is quite imperfect? I, th I think you just become a massive hypocrite. <laughs> right. But, but that's the, the joy of it, is that you start a game, and the first game I played, um, you miss a kick, by definition, you are imperfect. If mm -hmm. according to the definition that everything you do is on your CV for life, you're imperfect. Mm -hmm. But you, you delude yourself to being like, I've got to keep this game, I've got to be perfect. Mm -hmm. You refuse to listen because it's not relevant to your deeply held belief. Mm -hmm. And that hypocrisy kind of was what, or that delusion was what allowed me each game to still work myself into this fear that if I'm not perfect today, something terrible is going to happen. Instead of someone pointing out where well, you weren't last week and you're still here. Mm. But it's like that doesn't help. Yeah. So it is a, a weird thing. And, and often part of the stuff I do with people now is to point that out immediately to be like, look, you're worried about failing. Have you failed before? Yeah. Mm. You're still here. Yeah. You've still got all your potential. You can still reach. You mm. can still drive. The things you didn't want to happen have already happened. At what point will you be open to saying, I can handle any of that, which gives you the ground to then really shoot. Yeah. But whilst you're trying to control the bottom, 
you're still trying to control the top. And I, I mentioned this about my career. When I was doing that, I played my career between six and eight on the scale of what I was really capable of. If 10 was, you know, that infinite sure. potential I had, I played between six and eight because I was trying to keep, you know, keep away from whatever the worst was, mm. meant that I never really looked up until those moments in a game where you, you're in that special zone and you just see what you're really capable of. Mm. When you get out of your own way, and things just happen. And it happens to all people in all areas where afterwards you, you sit down and you go, how did I do that? The simple answer is you didn't. Mm. Something deeper than you is living through you and you allowed it. And, and finding that space, which often comes with your purpose, is such a powerful part of learning how to prepare, even if it's for things like exams or relationships or how you want to be. And, it's a beautiful journey and, and I was much more down the line of the more I suffer in the changing room, the more likely I am to find my zone on the field. Mm. It's, it's the other way around. You just become very good at suffering yeah. and take that onto the field with you. And speaking of those sort of perfect moments where you did get into the zone, I obviously have to ask about the iconic drop kick. Mm. And I wondered if you could take us back to that moment and kind of how you felt the pressure on you then, but also how you yeah. felt afterwards. There's, there's no doubt it's the most, there's probably been a handful of moments that I can recount where I've been in a space where nothing makes sense anymore. You know, like the way you see the world, life, other people, the way you understand you, you, you and what you are and what everything else is and just all becomes confused because something happens and that was probably the top of the list because I think if I'd been, if you'd have presented that on a piece of paper, that opportunity at that time and said, look, this is what's about to happen. This is what's on the line. Mm. This is what what's, you know, happens if you miss. This is what's gone into it. This is what everyone else wants. This is even in the tournament itself. But then you think, well, okay, not just the tournament, but the six years before, and then your entire life mm. and your dreams. The fact that I was in the garden with my brother numerous times, Oh, three, two, one, it's to Johnny, he kicks it out. Mm. Uh, and now it's happening. If you present that logically and try to handle it up here, you just freeze, mm. you just fall on the floor. You become just paralyzed by the whole situation. But in that moment when the ball came to me, as soon as it was on its way to me, and even maybe a bit before, I just, not and there's no talent in me doing this it just happened i just i wasn't there mm. i'm sort of there and i'm sensing it and i'm feeling it and i'm watching it and i'm understanding it but i'm not doing it it's just happening and i realized then that i must have hit maybe with my right foot maybe a quarter of a million drop goals in my life leading mm. up to that moment wow if I think about from kid, young age and the ludicrous levels that I went to, mm. just constant. And here I am, and, the, and it's just, you suddenly realize that force that's making you go to the training pitch. Mm. And that fear that's making you say to your brother on Christmas day, who's been out there behind the post catching balls for an hour and a half. And I missed the last one and go, that's it, we're starting again. And he's like, oh, for shit's sake. <laughs> Like it's Christmas morning, there's mm. snow on the ground. And you realize that all of these factors that were just playing through you, getting you to do this work, were there to train a certain, the body into a certain way. And the ball hits you and suddenly the body is just doing what it does. And I mm. see the ball leave my hand and I see that it drops, the way it drops slightly in and slightly here, I can, as soon as that happens, I know what the kick's gonna be. And I'm here just watching, knowing, and then my foot arrives and it's all just, I'm playing it out just ahead of time and it's happening and I'm lost in it. And then the ball goes through the post and it just goes through the post. And then suddenly I reemerge into the, the situation and kind of go, oh, it's gone over. And I look round. suddenly I'm like, now I didn't celebrate because I wasn't there when it was happening. I celebrated just afterwards. Mm. And it, it's weird that when I look back at it now, it makes perfect sense. But at the time when everyone's like, geez, why are you doing that? You know, why not, why don't you take it easy? You're kind of like, there's something in me 
And there are balances to find, but there's also trust in these moments where you feel a bit impulsive and you feel a bit driven to do things, but then it all unfolds. Mm. And at that moment, like I said, it came, I didn't think, oh, should I pick left foot or right foot? While M Matt Dawson was passing the ball, I wasn't thinking, oh, it's up to me now. I just wasn't thinking. Mm. The ball hits you and it's just an out of body experience. And then straight away afterwards, you click back in and your mind starts going, we need to get the ball off the field, we need to win the game and everything. Mm. But it's, it's so incredible that you can't choose to have them. You just have to, you just have to put yourself ready for them. You just have to be ready yeah. for those kind of moments. And ready just means, in a rugby terms, just be in the game. Yeah. And that's what I guess for me has become, ever since that moment, is understanding how can I position myself to be receptive to something more from life than what I'm used to. Um, and it's been interesting because, you know, like I said, the day after that, I went back to grinding and kicking more and kicking more and kicking more. Um, on my right side, I kicked so many balls that my adductor just came clean off the bone of my leg. Mm -hmm. And whilst it was coming off for about two or three weeks, it was coming off my leg um, and I was still kicking. And I, the first kick would cause so much pain that I'd collapse to the ground. The second one, a bit less pain. Third one, a bit less. And by the sixth one, I was like, I feel good now. I did that for a month and a half before having to confess to the physio <laughs> and say, look, we've got a problem. Sounds and, great. Yeah, exactly. And he was like, what have you done? And sure yeah. enough, that's kind of, yeah. you understand that, yes, there is a balance, but there's also an incredible force behind it. And that moment for me in that World Cup, I've been in other games when I was in France later in my career where you're waiting to hit that drop goal at the end of the game. And all you can think about is, oh shit, it's on me. Mm. What if I miss? And in that World Cup final, not one moment was I thinking that. Mm. I was just there, ready, and knowing that that was part of my, part of my path. But that moment you're talking about with, with the zone, I mean, I feel like so much of that is coming from your incredible discipline, right? Like the fact that you've practiced for hours and hours and hours and hours so that you can get into that moment where you're not really thinking about what you're doing. And I wondered if as, you know, not the most disciplined student myself and with lots of other students in the room, whether you could maybe give us some advice on, on how to get that kind of discipline into your life. There's kind of, for me, I, like the first thing I'd say already is that I know nothing about anyone else. Mm. So I can't preach to knowing anything. What I can say is this is my experience yeah. and it may resonate, it may not. Um, one thing I've, I maybe look at differently is I've never had a problem with getting motivated. Mm. My issue has been maybe the other way, but there's certain understandings about discipline, about, and it comes down, I think at the beginning to what is it you really want and understanding that if you really want something, you find out what it is that you really want and then you understand best as you can, what needs to be done right now that's in alignment with that. <coughs> and you set yourself a task and you finish it. You just finish it. Mm. Now, one of the things that gets in the way of that is this idea that we know what's coming. So I get this already now. So as much as I say that I'm very motivated in certain areas, because I still have a deep purpose in those areas, I love spending time with my daughter. I mm. absolutely love spending time with my daughter. And she loves playing imagination games. But you know, when you wake up and you're kind of like, oh gosh, I didn't sleep that well. Mm. And it's seven in the morning and you're kind of heading downstairs and she's like, come and play. And the first thing that goes through your mind is, oh gosh, because you get a picture of what you think that's gonna be mm. according to what you've maybe had before. And it's that picture that you react to, not the opportunity. Mm. And it's the same way that whenever you meet anyone, whatever opinion you've got of them is just an idea derived from what you've seen before. But if the possibility of your life always goes through what you've seen before, it can only get marginally better or worse. Mm. But if you wanna make quantum leaps, you gotta leave that unknown, unknown. So what I have with my daughter now, she says, play, and I know that all my job is, is to get started mm. and leave the story. Because when you talk about motivation, mostly the thing that stops you doing it is you've already got an idea about how tough it's gonna be. Mm. I've got to phone that person. Oh, it's gonna be such a long call. And they're always like this, and it's such a boring thing. 
So you don't do it. Yeah. If you leave that alone, you realize that none of what you think about anyone else is true. Mm. Nothing. You know nothing about anyone else. You also know nothing about what's possible. So to let go of what you've been through leaves that space open for you to go and create something special, which adds a bit more excitement. But then it's the case of just finishing the task, setting small time limits and in, you know, giving yourself five minutes mm. rather than this is going to, you know, I'm going to do this for an hour. Start with five, make it seven and those things. So that for me works in some areas, but the main of all these things, the main crux is that if you want to change your life in some way, it, 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 takes, it takes courage. Yeah. And courage is always in the direction of what you find hardest. Mm -hmm. Now, as a player, I wasn't that courageous because it just wasn't that difficult for me to go and put my head somewhere where it was going to get kicked. Mm -hmm. It wasn't hard. It wasn't hard for me to get in the gym and do more. <clears throat> it wasn't hard for me to kick longer on the field. It wasn't hard for me to think more about the game. But what I wanted to be was a bigger and better player. But what that required was courage to do the things that I wouldn't do, that I knew had benefit, like rest, like trust, mm. like not beat the hell out of myself because something's just not gone wrong. Mm. That would have taken courage. And it made me feel vulnerable, but I didn't do it. And because I didn't do it, I didn't get to explore that space of what I could have been. And now that courage is always different for people. Some people, that courage will be in the direction of, oh, I can't bring myself to do it, it's so much work. But in the gym, I might look at a rowing machine and go, oh gosh, it's so much work. Anyway, and it's not that courageous. Mm -hmm. But what's courageous for me is what I'm doing at the moment is that I spend most of my time uh, stretching mm -hmm. and warming up and doing tiny little exercises to fix my shoulders. And I hate it because my whole body is saying, let's go and smash this. And let's sprint up and down this hall as many times until you crawl out the gym because that feels good. So you move in the direction of what's courageous. So when you say about what's discipline, it's like, well, how much do you want it? Mm. And if you want it that much, are you willing to do the thing which feels the most uncomfortable, which will be the thing that evolves you into who you're meant to be that aligns with having that thing in your world? Because at the moment, my world, who I am and my world are linked. When I shift, my world shifts. But if I want my world to shift without me shifting, but if you're going to shift, you have to go through stuff you've not been before. Mm. And for me, I had that chance. I never went to the physio. I never got massaged. I never did that stuff because I looked at it and went, what's the point? Yeah. Deep down, I was like, I won't do it. Why not? It scares the shit out of me. Mm. So you've talked a lot then about how, you know, you dealt with your own uh, think that things that motivated you and, and how perhaps you don't find it as difficult to I don't know, get on the treadmill, but also you've had to captain. You've had to lead other people who I'm sure some days did find it hard to, to do that extra you know, hour in the gym or whatever it might be. And I really enjoyed seeing, there's a clip of you where you're giving a team talk in France and you're in two different languages at once. And I thought that was a really good way to show that all the, all the different kind of barriers that you're facing when you're bringing a team together. So I wondered if you could talk a bit about how you brought teams together as a captain and what some of the strategies you used were? Um, I've, I mean, I've, I've been a terrible captain. <laughs> I've been a terrible, terrible captain. And I've been, I think, maybe an okay one. It's not really my job to decide what a good captain I've been. Mm. Maybe not even a bad one, because that's for other people in terms of a leadership thing. But um, my, I guess, my biggest thing was it becomes really easy to to lead when you when you deeply care about the people you're with and that's not their job mm. to do enough for you to care you just care yeah. on a human level and we had people at Toulon from South Africa and from England and France and and New Zealand and Australia, and we had people that were playing, people that weren't. Some of the people that weren't were finding it difficult, mm. and some of their behaviors may have looked a bit like, oh, that's a bit off, but none of that matters. Mm. It's not about, oh, you need to behave this way for me to care about you. You just care anyway. Because, like I said before, once you remove that story on yourself about this is who I am, I'm special, you remove everyone else's, and you can get down to where you properly come together. Mm. Otherwise, 
the conditional nature of leadership, it just goes against everything, team spirit and everything. So that was almost my issue. And like I said, when I've not been a great captain is because the story I had for myself, by the time we'd won the World Cup, the story I had for who I was was so strong. I didn't shout about it because I like to think I was modest and humble, but gosh, the way I considered, I know how everything works because I've done it and we've won. And then I would look at all these people around me and I'm supposed to be the leader. It turns out, you know, when I was a young England player, I got in a few situations where I felt, you know, I was kind of shouted out in a certain way and, and it completely, um, tore me apart to the point that I was kind of almost didn't want to be there anymore. I was considering like trying to go home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is like before huge tournaments, I just, but I was kind of almost like, I can't bear it. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, I will never do this to anyone else. Mm -hmm. And by the time we'd won the World Cup, when I look back, I'm doing it to other people, the way I'm talking to them. And I think I'm being that awesome captain. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking in a way that's, it's so disrespectful. Really? And when you look at being a leader or a coach, you're kind of like, well, I want the best out of the people that I'm coaching. But you try and get the best out of people by making them angry, scaring them or belittling them. That's honestly how you think you're going to get the best out of them. Mm -hmm. So what my point was, if I'm going to get the best out of these people, you can only inspire them to get the best out of themselves. And what makes people prepared to do amazing things? Now, I saw this article recently of uh, uh, someone had put in place this understanding of performance like what are the emotional basis of performance and where do they rank and it was all to do with you know it's also linked into certain types of brain waves but they had at the very bottom of performance um it was a spiritually based thing but it was it was guilt so when you're performing out of guilt you're at the lowest resonance mm. now how often is it you're playing and your mind starts making you feel guilty imposter syndrome I shouldn't be here. Someone else should. How much do you put that on someone else? You should never have done that. It's what we used to do to the opposition. You know, like you're playing against someone, they throw a ball on the floor. Oh shit, you lost it for your team there, haven't you? That's what you do. You do it naturally. You yeah. put people in guilt or shame is the next one up, but you put people in that because something in you knows that's the worst performing emotion, mm. but you also do it to yourself. And then as you go up, you go through, uh, anger, frustration, and all these other ones. And then you get to fear. And anger and fear are just below the line where it breaks into positive because they're the ones that you mostly think this is how you're going to do it. So we'd have team talks before a game where I might be with the boys in France or whatever, and you'd be like, oh, and you've got that feeling where everyone's like, shit, anything's possible. You could do this. I'll be there if you do that. Oh, my gosh, let's get out there. And the coach says, right, come in, team talk. If we don't win today, we're done. You're like, oh gosh, fear. This team you're playing think you're a bunch of mercenaries. They got no dis they got no respect for you. I just heard them in the change room saying this, anger. Mm. And we were like, geez, we were just buzzing out there. Mm. And now you look at the guys when they leave the talk, they're like, oh, and you hear the way they're thinking. Suddenly the talk has been from, well, if you do that, we could do that, is now, um, yeah, you will do that when you and, and we need to make sure we get you're like, oh, we've moved. And so the line happens and above the line is joy, love, gratitude, all these things where you're in that zone. And the thing, as we were saying before, that breaks anger, fear, the thing, the gap between that and the positive, as we were saying before, is courage. Mm. So when you're playing through courage. And, and so that for me is almost like if you're going to lead, you have to be where do you want to bring? What are you going to be on that scale? Yeah. It's hard because if you want to be joyful, loving, grateful, courageous. It's like but those times when you react naturally to who you were, I feel guilt when I'm in this situation. Mm. You kind of, you got to work on that. Otherwise, that's what you bring. You know, so I'm a great leader, but if, if, if I think I'm a great leader, but you play a game and something goes wrong and you're there in guilt, that's what everyone's looking at. Mm. So you, you have to find that consistency of what is it that, what is it you want to be? And how do you be it? And it's your job on you. But most of us think we need to work on this guy over here. It's like, but as soon as you find that joy, however you need to speak to that other person, mm. it just comes out beautifully. When you're feeling good, if you need to manage a situation, you just manage it. 
and it just works. You don't know how you did it. If you're on the field and you feel in that space of just, you're just in the zone, you come up with something, it's like, how did that happen? Mm. You don't know, but it's just unfolding from that energy or you're in the other energies where everything feels like an effort. Yeah. You're just manipulating people and you're, you're putting them against each other and you're making them feel rubbish because you think they're going to do this. And so for me, I guess at some point early in my career, I was too busy working on everyone else mm. because I'd made it. But essentially, I was full of guilt, <laughs> full of shame, full of you know fear. And by the end of my career, I got so tired of trying to get all these things right that I pretty much gave up and just fell into love and gratitude for the fact that I had some time left and I was enjoying it. And suddenly, these people I'm with, I'm like, it's a privilege to be next to you. It's a privilege to be able to play with you. Mm. It's a privilege to play against you. It's a privilege to be beaten by you. It's a privilege to miss that tackle. It's just a privilege to be here and be alive. Yeah. And then suddenly everyone's like, what a leader. <laughs> You're like, I've given up. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've been talking a lot, both kind of directly and indirectly about mental health. But I wanted to speak about it a little bit more directly now. So you've been very open about facing some quite serious mental health struggles um, while you were playing and I'm assuming afterwards as well. And I wondered, when was the moment that you felt you could talk up about it? Like what changed that meant you were able to speak up instead of kind of staying quiet and facing it on your own? I, th I think just a realization in me came that it's, it's, not, it's not really mental health. It's just, it's just everyone's life journey. Mm. Everyone is in a space where you resist and you have issues and you don't feel how you want to and you have doubt and it hurts and everything. And there are different extremes, obviously, all the way down to things that I can't imagine to all the way up to things I can't imagine. But we're all on that scale. Now, at some point, someone's put an imaginary line and gone, after that, that's mental health. But apparently above that line, when we are all still suffering something that happened 20 years ago, and we're all still fearing something that may never happen, mm. in order to take away the only thing we have, which is now, mm. you're like, well, that sounds pretty insane as well. So why isn't that below the line? But we say that's normal, but this is mental health. What I started to realize was it's just about understanding that you have, everyone has dreams and aspirations and everyone has kind of, whether it's inherited or whether it's um, learned or conditioned or just some blockages to that. And when you come up against them in your life, that's a key moment. So I say this to people that I meet is that when you're in that space, when you're having a bit of a crisis moment, you're the ones that are on the field. And when all of us are living that kind of, yeah, it's life's good, mm. we're on the bench and you're playing. And when you play, you play for all of us. Mm. So when you're on that field, and that's not to put pressure on people in that space, not at all. The other idea is that when you are taking your resistance and your tension and your fear and all that energy and you yourself are converting it into openness, expansive love, connection, joy, opportunity, when you do it within you, you do it for everyone. Mm. And so when you're going through it, you're on the field. And the job of everyone around the field, on the bench, in the crowd, when you're on the field, is to support you, just like we were as rugby players. You have physios, you have doctors, you have coaches, you have specialist coaches, you've got teammates, you've got this, you've got that. So when someone's, because you're the ones on the field playing for the club, but now if you've got mental health, it's like, and someone's got it, you're like, they're the star. They're doing the work. They're doing it. This is real. This, will, this is real stuff. Support them any way you can in a way that just allows them to feel that they can take on that challenge. And because when you convert that energy from darkness to light, we all feel it. And if enough people are doing that work, the world changes. Or alternatively, you know what it's like when you, you feel like the opposite movement in you and you start following those dark thoughts and acting on them or whatever. That is also what creates that sense of fear that we've had around us for the last five years, maybe. Mm. In the air, people start going a bit like, why am I feeling like this? It's in the air, but it's like, but we're all taking that, feeling it, but can we be a filter for that? It's what we used to say in rugby, is you catch a bad pass, mm. you filter it through you to give a good one. Mm. But if you're not conscious about your body and your ability to move, what you do is catch a bad pass and throw a worse one. And that next person is like, whoa, and he's getting destroyed in the ribs. And he's like, thanks very much. Or you can be those geniuses that I've played with who go, mm. and you're like, whoa, how do you do that? I just worked on myself. Mm. Are you hopeful for younger, 
long, sorry, younger players coming in that they'll have a better experience with, you know, perhaps more support or more open conversation. Do you think it's changing? Yeah, yeah, definitely. But then the balance, the, the balance will always shift to then understanding that in in sport and performance, you have a desired outcome. Mm. So that desired outcome is is not a continual path because, like in life, you have it's just this beautiful, never-ending path. Whereas in a game, it's 80 minutes, and by the end of it. That's the result. So you have to become a bit of a defined structure to play the game. Yeah. You have to have views. So there will be this need to have an immense focus and be quite ruthless and be quite, it needs to get done and to have very quick lessons and that feedback. But there needs to be a subtlety of how we all tune into that to allow it to be enjoyable and everyone to be express themselves. But if everyone comes in with that spirit safe of, oh, you know, it's all beautiful. <laughs> You come in and a team comes in that is like, we're here to play, you get blown off the field. Mm. But if you're in there being like, oh, guys, let's get it right. And a team comes in like France, who have got that kind of ability to move and that flair and that kind of connection, they blow you away. But can you be that team that when it's needed, you are bang? Mm. And then suddenly you're like, ah, and then you're bang. Ah, mm. and that's what it looks like. That's what life looks like. You just become what you need to become intuitively. So if I need to be stern here, it's like, okay, I'm going to be stern because it's necessary. But you're emotionally responsive. But we can't just decide this is right. Let's all do this. Mm. This is wrong. Let's never do this. You're like, well, no, let's just get in tune with yourself mm. and understand how to align with what you want. And you'll find out you become the perfect tool for that. Problem was with me is that I became great at winning those games on a field. I became rubbish at living life off it mm. because I was, I was essentially wearing that rugby shirt when I was playing and then I came off the field and I'm having dinner with my mates and I'm still wearing my bloody kit. I've still got my boots on. I'm still thinking about the game. I still can't let go of what that is. I'm still worried about the game coming. What I wasn't able to do was go, right, shirt off. That's done. Yeah. Put my friend's dinner shirt on and be like, ah, when it comes to bedtime, shirt off, pajamas on, yeah. sleep. But how many of us go to bed in our work shirts? Still, I just can't sleep because I'm thinking about that. The ability to just be able to say, this isn't relevant. This is relevant. Can I be what I need to be? And we get to practice that all day. You used the word ruthless there. Um, and just the last couple of things I did want to ask about before we went on to audience questions is about the Six Nations. And after the Italy and England game, you said that England needed to be a bit more ruthless in their playing. And I was wondering what that means in practice. What does that mean on you know, for the captain for the players it's a, it, it's a you know it's a good question i think there's i think something really happens when you have certain kind of energies that just they know exactly what they want so maybe having those forces that are just like bang and you have to hold them back and then you have others which are a bit more kind of, you know, laid back and you have to push them forward. Mm. But without those forces really going after what they want, it can just lose that ruthless edge. That's what the ruthless side is. Mm. And so I think just having that ability for people to go, right, I'm on the field. This is what we're doing. And I don't give a shit what happens. I don't care. Yeah. I'm doing this. Why? Because I know this is right. And when it doesn't work out, you sit there and go, okay, I'm open to learn. But when I go on the field, this is happening. This is happening. And you have that idea that when someone's running at you, you're like, you're getting destroyed. It's happening. And if it doesn't, you stand up and you go, but you are now. Yeah. You don't lose it. You just have that edge. And I think that's the ruthless side about a team that just goes out there and has that sense of, we can manage it out here. Mm. And I'll make that decision. I'm 21 years old, but I don't care. I'll make that decision. Yeah, in the, in the it's World Cup final, I'm 24. You're around the, the middle of the field. Do we kick it? Do we run it? Or do you go, oh shit, what do you think we should do? Or do you just go, we're kicking it? I'll live and die by this. Mm. I don't care if I get dropped. This is what I see. This is what I'm doing. And it's the same edge, I think, that, that I found a bit in France. If people had video meetings, they'd be like, oh, stop the video. What the hell are you doing here? And I'd say, right, if we're getting into that, I'll tell you exactly what I'm doing. I did that because of this. 
bang, 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 10 things because of what just happened, what was about to happen, because of what I felt the team was doing, because of who I was looking at, why I did it, everything. May not have executed it perfectly, but that's why I did it. The coach kind of says, moving on. <laughs> because what you're looking for is that player that goes, oh, I'm not sure, I just, uh, and you're like, mm. you want every player to say, it didn't work out, but that's why I did it. Yeah. And you say, well, yeah, the coach says, I know that's great, but maybe think about this, got it. I'll add that into my list. But there's this energy of like, I'm going. I'm going after this because we're playing to win. It doesn't matter if we lose, but I'm all in. And I think that's what I mean about that ruthless edge is that kind of sense of this is the last play of the game. Even though it's 10 minutes in, we defend this line here like it's our try line. Mm. And it's that sense of like, we will not be beaten. There's some of that mixed in with, we're a team that's rebuilding and we're, we're kind of, yeah, we've got a transformation going on and, and it's time to sort of, you know, transition between this team. But when we play, huh, this is how it is. And I think that's the, the edge, I think, that, that is coming. But I think it doesn't hurt to promote it a bit and to say, we'll stand by you. Yeah. Go out there, be you, go after what you want. If it doesn't quite happen, we're staying with you. I think it's much harder to really fire into something if you've got the feeling that the, you know, that the team's going to be like, sorry, off you go which happened to me a few times, you're like, I'm doing it. Didn't quite help. It's like, sorry, off you go, which is, you know, then suddenly you won't make those decisions. But I think they have that support now and it's time to, you know, to not be afraid to push on. Mm. Finally, before we go to the audience, what would your predictions be for the Six Nations this year? <laughs> I think um, just Ireland look brilliant. Yeah. I think they look as though they have that feel of what are you going to do against them? They've got that old New Zealand feel of you, you've got to live at that intensity and you've got to get that many things right against them. And as soon as you don't, ugh, they just score. It's, it's relentless. Like we're talking about ruthless, relentless. You're like, oh, how do you do that? And they come across as that ruthless side and that creative side. And now they've got new players coming in who are enjoying that, I'm not going to say armchair ride, but that beautiful momentum of having players around you that are looking after stuff. So you throw a bad pass, they make it look good. Mm. If you're that new player, you kick the ball and it doesn't quite go right, but you end up scoring down there and everyone's saying, great kick. You're like, yeah, thanks. It's that feeling. I had that for years with England. You're playing so well. It's like, this guy's just telling me what to do. It's like, that's, that's the beauty of that team. They've got a great setup, great energy. Um, and they're leading the way. I think France are at an interesting point. They're, sort of, they're still recovering a bit from the World Cup at home going out in the quarterfinals. So they've got some rebuilding, but they're dangerous. They just need to fill themselves up again um, and, and be who, you know, play to, to who they really are. And outside of that, I think Scotland are really exciting. I think brilliant, but they, they're obviously looking to see if they can hold that intensity. For, for England, I feel like it's a, it's a really big opportunity, but I think it, there has to be there has to be this real sort of like understanding this is what we're doing, which I think they've got, but then it's a case of like, let's go all in. Yeah. And it's difficult because of the expectation and trying to make sure you win and, but just go all in and, and live that up. But so I think for me, I, I see Ireland coming out on top. Yeah. Um, I see France being in there and dangerous, but possibly beatable, um, which should be interesting. Um, I see Wales as regrouping young and good for them. Um, good do time to do it. Um, Italy looked better, and, and I think you know for me England have um, yeah they've got a really they've got a good shot to make a difference in this as long as they stay with what they're doing, trust in it, and let people start to really really push forward and and make a statement. Well, keeping fingers crossed then. Uh, yeah. But maybe put your bets on Ireland for now. Yeah, yeah, I um, think so. Thank you so much. But, by the way, let me just finish. I'm in England. Um, I do coach with England, so okay. I'll always start with, I trust that they're going to win. Yeah. I just like, I just <laughs> okay. like, I like Ireland at the moment.